chapter 3. I'm having a heart attack, 12 years old, and I was going to die in the middle of the grocery store. My obituary would read, RJ the scaredy cat died between the frozen foods and the snacks. I had hoped I'd make it through at least another 12 years, but it wasn't looking good. The hand grabbing me felt familiar. There was no glove touching me. The fingers felt like the ones that had scratched my back as a kid while I fell asleep. The palm was the same one that held my hand when I was younger and crossing the street. The motion of the hand was the same as the one that had rubbed my shoulders to comfort me when Dad died. Slowly, I turned and got only a glimpse of the shopping cart because my hat shielded my view. Gradually, I lifted the brim higher. It was my mom. RJ, why are you yelling? Mom looked around, hoping that I wasn't causing a scene. Come on, we gotta go. Ed's waiting for us at home. Mom stared at me, probably wondering what was wrong with me. Great, Ed's there now. Mom's probably going to make this even worse for me. She'll probably tell him all about the grocery store. He'll probably want me to talk to him for hours about what exactly scared me. So annoying. Are you really scared at the grocery store? Mom asked. I thought we were working on this. You're almost a teenager. You have to try and be less scared, honey. Besides, you're in a grocery store. What are you worried about? She sounded a little frustrated as she rested her arm around my shoulder. Maybe it's time for another talk with Ed. Really open up to him. You know, he works with children. There wasn't anything I could say, so I nodded, hoping she wouldn't make me talk to Ed. I knew it was weird, but she hadn't seen what I had. Besides, at this point, she'd think I was overreacting like every other time I was scared. After a few glances over my shoulder to make sure we weren't being followed, I felt safe again, hoping that I never saw whatever I'd seen again. Later that night, Shelly and I put the finishing touches on our lemonade special. It was a blindingly bright, toxic yellow. I imagined how delicious it was. I couldn't wait to try it, and neither could Shelly. She was still mixing with her long plastic spoon, as if she were kayaking through the jar of lemonade. It was ready, but before we tasted it, we always let Mom try first. It was our tradition. Mom came into the kitchen wearing one of her purple scrub shirts from work. During her work days, she helped people, but on the eve of the lemonade stand, she was always the first victim. I mean, customer. I filled a small cup and handed it to my mother. She smelled the potent lemonade and took a swig. Her face turned bright red as she swirled the lemonade in her mouth. She held it in her mouth like a squirrel hoarding food for winter. Her eyebrows raised and her lips pressed together as she let out a loud whistling sound. We needed to add more water. Shelly and Mom filled up the pitchers as Ed walked into the kitchen. He slowly strutted in. His crooked smile caught my attention. I heard we may have to have a little talk, young man. Heard something got you spooked at the grocery store. I bowed my head. The moment I dreaded was here. I'm fine, I blurted out, hoping he'd know that was my leave my alone tone. What was I going to tell him? Some monster or something was in the aisle next to me with a cane that was probably going to go through my body? I'm not trying to sound crazy here. He came closer and reached out his arm, then put it over my shoulder. I tensed up, trying to knock it off. Ugh, why is he touching me? Beep, beep, beep. Ed's cell phone went off. He quickly checked his phone. It's the hospital. I gotta go. We'll continue this later. He looked sternly at me and then was gone. With mom's help, we compromised on the taste and then went to bed, though I bet she added more water to the pitchers while we were asleep. We had so much lemonade and way too many customers the next day. Or maybe I should say... One too many. I shot out of bed the next morning. I was so excited that I'd slept in my baggy cargo shorts. I wore those so I could fit all of the money in my pockets. We also had a jar for coins, but I was always prepared in case we ran out of places to keep the money. Lemonade stand day was my favorite. Used to be, anyway. I grabbed my hat and put it on my head, then rushed out of my room and knocked on my sister's door. Shelly was ready, too. She grabbed her purple fanny pack with a skull on it, tied her hair up with a yellow band, and ran down the stairs in her mismatched outfit. As I opened the front door, sunlight instantly warmed my body, and the air smelled crisp and clean. It was beautiful out, 
a perfect day for a lemonade stand. We each had two large pitchers of lemonade when Mom stumbled down the stairs, rubbing the tiredness from her eyes. She brought out the folding table for us. She was also there to talk to the neighbors, because we didn't have time for that. Besides, what, we, what would we talk to them about? Something cool? Yeah, right. Mom quickly set up the table at the end of our driveway. Then my sister and I placed the pitchers on top and hung our beautiful sign. Lemonade, 50 cents. We used the same sign every year. The words had started to fade over the years, and the red paint that we used to write lemonade and the price had started to run. It looked a little like blood. Not the message I was trying to get across, but Shelly was okay with that. The best, Shelly yelled as she slammed back one of the small cups and chucked it into the, our garbage can. Our next-door neighbor, the Swansons, were among the first to arrive. They were often the ones entrusted with keeping an eye on us when Mom was gone. That was supposed to be the case for later that night, as Mom and Ed were going to an event, but Shelly and I convinced them to leave us home alone. The Swansons were the nicest couple, but had such a sad story. Their 12-year-old son Wally went missing a few years after they came to town. That was long before we ever moved in. Wally was never found, although the Swansons searched everywhere for him. It was still a mystery. I often wondered why they didn't have more kids of their own. I never asked them about it, because I'm sure it, it makes them sad to think about Wally, but I probably would have been friends with their kid. All of our other neighbors came by, said hi, and bought cups of lemonade. Even Ed showed up at the stand. I wasn't sure if he was going to come out and support us, but he did. He wandered over to us and put some money in the jar, but he didn't drink any lemonade. Are you doing okay today? Ed asked while standing in front of me at the table. Yeah, of course, I'm fine, I responded, hoping someone would come up and need more lemonade so I could get out of this awkward situation. Ed barely showed any emotion when he responded. We should still talk. I think your mom would like that. Whatever, I said, pacing around, looking behind him as a new group of people approached. We have customers. Ugh, what the heck? Leave me alone, especially today. Every day he was on me, but he couldn't give me a break on lemonade stand day? I wanted to yell, you're not my dad, but what good would that do? The day went on and the stand was winding down. We had a jar full of money to donate to the charity, and we were running low on lemonade, partially because Shelly couldn't stop chugging it down. Geez, it was as if she'd eaten a bag of pretzels before we set everything up. I kept giving her a look, but she didn't care. She might as well have stuck her tongue out at me each time she drank another full cup. Out of nowhere, a breeze blew, and the sky changed from blue to purple in a matter of seconds. Then it was dark and gray, and the whole day changed. The perfect 80-degree summer day was shifting. A storm was approaching. I looked at all of the people gathered around the stand. They kept talking and didn't seem to notice. Neither did Mom, but it looked like Shelly looked at me up at the sky and then smirked. She seemed excited. She loved thunderstorms. Ed was talking with the Swansons. He stood tall next to them with a crooked, scheming smile on his face. Weird, because Ed never talked to anyone else in the neighborhood. I wasn't even sure the Swansons knew who he was, but maybe he was just introducing himself. For whatever reason, butterflies filled my stomach. To make matters worse, Johnny, Brad, and Coleman from school were riding their bikes up to the stand. What were they doing here? They always hassled me at school. I hoped that they wouldn't do that to me at home, too. The three of them pointed directly at me. I could feel the tension fill the air. RJ, let's go, Johnny yelled. We're going to number 13. Yeah, come on. Are you too scared? Brad chimed in. They laughed and cheered amongst themselves. They weren't funny. Why did they think they were? No one at the stand seemed to notice, except Shelly. She ran out into the street after them and yelled, Yeah, go see House 13. See what happens. They didn't look back. They kept pedaling toward the old scary castle, and I smiled. I was definitely, it was definitely going to rain, and they were going to get trapped in it. Finally, a win for me against the bullies. Darkness covered the sun. Thunder roared and lightning struck, I think. Of course, I hated that part. The wind whipped, nearly blowing over the whole table. I grabbed it and held on so it wouldn't topple over. Why wasn't anyone else afraid of this storm? I struggled to see through the darkness. Did the bullies make it to the castle? Then two beady, dark red beams stared back at me, headed in my direction. 
My knees buckled. If it weren't for holding on to the table, my body would have collapsed like a ton of bricks. Chills shook me on this warm summer afternoon. I might as well have looked straight into Medusa's eyes. It would have been better if I had turned into stone right then and there. Instead, as the red beams got closer, I realized that something was headed toward me. Quickly, I broke eye contact just as my mom saw my face. Didn't she see it too? She put her hand on my shoulder. What's wrong? I couldn't talk. My eyes darted back toward the creature headed my way, trying to motion for my mother. Look, I thought. Can't you see? I'm not crazy, am I? She never looked. Then one of the neighbors called her over. Mom left and started talking with them. Mom, no! Was that the same thing that I saw at the grocery store? The creature approached. It was a man. He was so tall, much taller than Ed, but he was mangy and dirty like a coyote, but moved like a squid lost on land. His eyes were dark, blood red, and sunken deep into a plastic gray mask. Then I saw the sharp end of the cane from the store. It was him. He was back for me. He got closer. His blistered lips bubbled like the top of a hot pepperoni pizza, oozing grease everywhere. Fresh sores formed as I stared. What was he doing here? How did no one else see this? I pulled my gaze away as fast as I could, hoping that he didn't see me. But he did. Slowly, he squirmed towards the stand. As he approached, people robotically parted, but without seeing him, and he walked through the middle of the crowd. I wanted to scream. This was like being on the scariest roller coaster ever, about to go down a steep drop. Maybe I could push the table over. If I knocked it over, then there wouldn't be any lemonade for him. Why did he want our lemonade anyway? He didn't. There was no way that he was here for that. Five yards away... I got a whiff of his aroma. It reminded me of my grandparents' old scary cellar. Mold, mildew, dry rot, fungus. Four yards. His creepy stare was fixed on me. His eyes were like laser beams locked on a target. I couldn't break away. I begged my legs to move, but they were mysteriously glued to the ground. I wanted to scream at my feet. Run, he's coming. Three yards. His cane scraped across the blacktop, leaving small scratches as he got closer and closer to the table. Two yards. My sister noticed my fright, looked at me, then at him. I'm not crazy. She saw him too. Didn't she? One yard. Ah! That's the end of chapter three.